Welcome to the All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris, and today I'm joined with Bryce Andrews, an author of an amazing book that, honestly, I cannot put down, and we're going to talk about it today. But welcome, Bryce. Oh, thank you, Chris, for having me. Oh, it, it's I'm so excited. You know, it, it's doing this work, this podcast, you know, talking to people throughout the world. I'm going to be honest with you. I cannot put this book down. I read it in two nights. That is wonderful. I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> It's, I literally, I was up the first night because I knew we were, we were playing this interview and thank you for the free copy to your publicist, but I got it and I literally, I couldn't put it down. And I, I told myself, I'm like, okay, you got to stop, go to bed. And then the <laughs> next night I picked it up and I just finished it. I, I think it was like one thirty in the morning. And so my, well, my partner's yeah. like, what were you doing last night? And I, just, I can't, it was that good. It was that well, good folks. That's what, that's what authors always hope for. I mean, it, you spend like I did spend three years working on a book and, you know, mm-hmm. sort of obsess about it endlessly. And that's just really nice to hear that it, it strikes you that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's so the, the book title, and of course everybody's, you know, it's going to be in our show notes in the links, but it's down from the mountain. The Life and Death of a Grizzly Bear by author Bryce Andrews. It just for our listeners, it captures human wildlife conflict so perfectly. And I just want to say this up front: it's because we, you know, especially here from the United States, and most of our audience is from the United States, but we do have a global reach. You know, we always go, oh, Africa or South America or even Australia. We have a pretty good listenership down there. It's somebody else's problem, but this brings it home to us, right? I mean, this is a United States problem too. Sure. It's, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's an issue that is uh, very much a reality for people in my part of the world, which I I live in Montana. And Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that's really, really interesting about this story is, you know, it couldn't happen except for the fact that grizzly bears are, uh, you know, they're animals that use the whole landscape. They come out of the mountains, they end up in the valley floor. So it's, very much like a truly a backyard issue for a lot of people in this part of the world. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you cover it. Uh, people, you have to buy this book, go out and buy this. I'm not just saying that because he's on our podcast. I'm telling you, if you care about animals and conservation and you really want to understand human wildlife conflict, this book captures it perfectly. Thus, I, I couldn't put it down. It, it was that good. <laughs> so, so we'll talk more about the book throughout. I, I, I always like to start out the you know, these interviews, if you can just kind of give us a, a background, you know, where you grew up and, and obviously you just said you're, you're living in Montana right now. Yeah, I could, I can tell you that. Um, so I guess I'll kind of, you <clears throat> know, a little bit of a backwards way, start with where I am. So I'm, I'm talking to you from uh, my farm, which is in the Jocko Valley, uh, right up next to the edge of the rattlesnake wilderness and very near the uh, Mission Mountain Range, which is the place where the book takes place. But I wasn't I was not born and raised near this landscape. I was raised uh, in the the heart of Seattle um, by uh, two very loving parents who um, were really involved in the art world. My dad ran the University of Washington's Art Museum and my mom uh, is a professional photographer. And so I, I guess I tell you that by way of saying that I started my story far away from this arid, rugged, mountainous landscape where I've made my home and my living for um, really my my whole adult life. Um, so I had to find my way into the Rocky Mountain West. And for me, that started with, uh, as it does for many people, started with visits. Um, we'd come out here in the summer. My, my dad loved to fish and he'd bring me out here. And at a certain part or a certain point, we started um, visiting uh, my my atheist godparents, as they like to be called, uh, Pat and Susie Zentz. And Pat's a third generation rancher um, here in Montana, also uh, a very gifted sculptor. And so I started learning about the work of agriculture and the way that ranching in, in the Rocky Mountains um, can be a way of uh, a lens through which you can look at land. And that really fascinated me. So I moved out here after I was done with college uh, took a job on a ranch um, right along the edge of uh, Yellowstone National Park in the Madison Valley. I took this job, which was like, you know, just the mountains that you imagine from postcards. And we were taking care of 1,300 yearling steers and heifers. And we had wolves and bears and all these predators on the landscape. And and I ended up, I'm telling you that because 
this it was a really pivotal moment in determining my trajectory because mm -hmm. in the course of doing that work, I ended up right in the heart of this conflict between uh, wolves and cattle. So we had a big pack of wolves on the ranch and they started killing cattle every day. And I was, as a, a ranch hand, plunged into that dynamic and forced to do things that I found really difficult and, um, you know, difficult to process even. Um, I was forced to do a lot of hard things and and see some really interesting things. And that uh, that was the subject of my first book, Bad Luck Way. And that really pointed me down this road that I've followed ever since, which is working at the uh, you know, the convergence of agriculture and wilderness. So I've worked as a ranch uh, hand, a ranch manager. I started my own uh, cattle operation with a friend, um, I worked as a ranch consultant. And, and then um, the last four years or so, I've been working, um, I've been working as a conservationist for a group called mm -hmm. People and Carnivores, which specializes in reducing conflict uh, between people and big predators like bears and wolves. No, I, it's so that at the beginning of the book, you you do talk about it, and I'm not going to try to give away the book in this interview because I really want people to read this. It hit home for me. I mean, you know, my own story years ago. This is going back nine, eight, nine years. I'm a professor, at University of Florida, teaching you know horses and livestock classes, and then I'm seeing what's going on globally. It changed in me too. I I, I read the science, I read the data, and I realized. I had a platform to make a difference and that's when I changed. So I think it's amazing that your experience. And so you said bad luck way, right? That's the book that kind of describes yeah. how you gravitated towards conservation. I, you know, yeah. Bad luck way um, deals with, I mean, I know we're not here to talk about it today. No, 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 no. I'll no. tell you yeah. really, I'll tell you really, yeah. really briefly. It, it deals with, um, it, it takes place over the course of a calendar year. So mm -hmm. I showed up on the Sun Ranch, which was huge, 21 acre or 21,000 acre ranch, uh, just on the edge of a beautiful wilderness. I showed up there, you know, fresh from the city and basically ended up having to try to figure out, you know, is there a way that we can run these cattle here without having to, uh, you know, kill the, the large predators that are on the mm -hmm. landscape that, that begin mm -hmm. to kill the cattle? And so it's all about the way that unfolds and, and some of the messy and difficult realities of, of mm -hmm. trying to make your living in agriculture um, in a place that is in many ways still wild. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No. Okay. Good. I'm, I'm going to get that one next. I promise you. Cool. <laughs> so, but okay. So we're, we're here to talk about down from the mountain, a, a amazing story. And we're going to talk a little bit about Millie, the grizzly bear. But I guess my question was, were you always fascinated with bears growing up? No, actually, that's, that's a really interesting thing. I, so, you know, bears were so far from being part of my existence as a kid mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in urban Seattle. You know, I think I gravitated, um, you know, I, I definitely worked my way toward everything wild that I could lay my hands on. Um, mm -hmm. But where I was, that, that meant uh, the ocean, usually. Um, it mm -hmm. meant, you know, a very different kind of uh, nature than, than I live uh, close to now. So yeah, bears were something that um, I sort of came at them without really knowing that I was about to <laughs> run into a creature that was so powerful and so interesting and that so fully captures the challenges of, of what we need to do to preserve wilderness in the contemporary West. Um, mm -hmm. I remember the first time I saw a bear, a grizzly bear in the wild, which was on the Sun Ranch, uh, the ranch we were just talking about. And the thing that struck me um, was just how this is something I've talked about and written about a lot, how nimble they are, how quickly they can go from a thing that seems heavy and ponderous and massive, mm -hmm. um, how quickly they can go from that to just like supple, beautiful, quick movement. I mean, I remember watching a sow and a cub uh, running across a pasture and climbing over a barbed wire fence. <laughs> and the way they moved, just like I, I couldn't stop watching them. Mm -hmm. I remember thinking like thinking this is something I've never seen the equal of. And I still feel like that when I see them. I've been, I think less than four feet away from a grizzly bear, but I was behind, I was protected contact at accredited zoo. And I'll tell you what I've been next to, well, there was a lion that was scared me and I was protected contact. He was just enormous. But I'll yeah. tell you what, the, the grizzly bear just staring at me, drooling, and then you look at those claws. 
I was like, right. wow, wow. They're just, they're so beautiful, so amazing. And I respected the heck out of her. So. <laughs> well, no, you know, that's, yeah. yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go, 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 go. Um, well, no, I just, I mean, the thing about seeing a bear close up, um, particularly in the wild, but I think this holds true, you know, when the bear is in confinement to some extent, mm-hmm. um, there's such a mix of things. Like I was just talking about how when they move, it's this mix of power and grace. But when you look at them, there's a mix of something that's deeply threatening. I mean, that's what, you know, what mm-hmm. you're talking about when you see, you know, when you, for me, it's like the size of the mouth. When you, when a grizzly bear opens its mouth <laughs> yes. and you see just how much pink muscle is in there, yes, it's just yes. like, there's like three inches of muscle on the outside of their jaws. And there's something about that that's just terrifying. And yet the eyes, when you look at a bear that's not raging, that's not charging, there's just something about their eyes that's um, tranquil, that's calm. You know, because I've I've been close to all three of our really large predators um, out here. And, you know, I've I've actually helped uh, trap and collar all three of them, which is a really interesting way to be close to them in the wild and, and, you know, it's, it's one of those rare chances where you actually get to look at the animal in the eye. Um, and these were all for research or helping the, you know, fish and game here in Montana. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing that I remember about looking into a bear's eyes versus a wolf or a mountain lion is just, there's, there's some quality to the bear's eye that's different and calmer mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and less. And it may come from just how, just how much their life varies from moment to moment. You know, they're not always hunting. They're, mm-hmm. they're curious. They, they use the landscape really differently. I was going to say intelligent. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Cause I think your book, how you describe what they're doing. And, and, and I, I guess that's where we could jump right now. Sure. The, so you're talking about intelligence. So the book, a lot of the book describes, you know, it's not only Millie's life and her struggle to raise her cubs, but really the book surrounds how you personally try to work with this farmer, has this large corn crop, and you're trying to figure out how to protect the corn because that's the farmer's livelihood. And and for our listeners, again, I'll, I'll, I'll say in the book, you describe beautifully how farmers today, and these aren't mega farms that people think of. These are just an older gentleman that is out there scratching out a living, you know, trying to put food on his table. The bears come down, they destroy some of his crop and he's losing tens of thousands of dollars each year. So you step in and trying to find a solution. And, and that's a big part of the book. I was going to say it, you describing on how to, <laughs> how to keep them out of that crop and how intelligent they are. So is that, you know, I guess one of the things is, is that one of the things you're seeing in Montana said, you know, this, this scenario, not just this farmer who's been there for many years, but you talk a lot about people coming into that, into the Mission Valley, setting up this intense grizzly bear human conflict. Is that what you're starting to see a lot of up there? You know, I think that's a fair characterization. So a a few things are going on that relate to this and that bear mentioning. Um, That's a terrible pun. Um, Yeah. And I didn't mean it. Um, So (laughs) we do it all the time. You've got, you have more people coming into this landscape all the time. Um, This is a beautiful part of the world and people uh, like me, you know, I didn't grow up here. People are constantly being drawn here uh, by the promise of living next to or within wilderness areas. Um, So you have more people on the landscape and some of those people um, don't have much experience living with bears. Um, That's creating an opportunity for conflict because Every new person on the landscape, you know, they're walking through the hills. They could run into a bear. They're, they've got a trash can. It may or may not be secure. They might decide, hey, I want to keep, you know, three chickens in the backyard. Um, and, you know, so they might be doing these things that are um, unwittingly putting bears at risk. At the same time, the story of bear conservation in, in the northern Rockies here is one of um, slow but steady steps back from the brink of um, extermination in the lower 48. So um, in the 1970s, we had about 700 bears left in the contiguous United States. And, so, and now we have about 1,800. And that's all due to the Endangered Species Act. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they were placed under protection 
uh, in the, the 70s and ever since they've been making these strides back from the brink. Um, so we have more bears on the landscape. That's what I'm saying. More people and more bears equals more opportunity for trouble. Now there's a third, uh, and this is perhaps the most important thing to understand with regard to Millie's story and, and the issue um, for bears right now. Um, we have a landscape that is changing, right? So we have, I mentioned the fact that it's being developed. So we have um, more human presence in the corridors that bears would use to get from the wilderness areas where they today survive and thrive to places like uh, the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness, the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness, places that used to have bears that are historic grizzly range, um, but that now have none. The pathways they would use to connect those chunks of habitat that go across the valley floors in our part mm -hmm. of the world, those places are getting more crowded. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we've got um, a changing climate and we have changing agricultural technology. So, you know, the, the, the cornfield that, that this book is about is a great example. You know, we're here in the Mission, well, I'm here in the Jocko Valley, so I'm right next door mm -hmm. to the Mission Valley where the book takes place. And I have a neighbor who's a, uh, uh, he's, you know, he's probably in his 60s. He's been farming and ranching here. He's a member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, which is um, the tribes uh, for whom this reservation was reserved. Um, he tells me that in his opinion, spring is coming a month earlier than it did when he was a kid. Yep. Now that's apocryphal and you can take it with a grain of salt, but I think you have to look at that. And, and he can back that up by saying, I'm getting one more cutting of hay than I used to. Mm -hmm. And say so we have a changing climate and that's allowing different things like the corn that forms the center of this book story. Different things are being grown in the landscape. And some of them pose very dangerous attractants to bears that threaten to break their seasonal round and, the, and mess up the way they are using the landscape. Uh, it, it, yes. In the book, it, it's, you do such a great job describing that and how modern agriculture or this, and it's not so much, you know, it, the book doesn't describe like you're right, somebody out hiking in the wilderness and running into wildlife. This yeah. is humans developing and really ruining natural habitat for many, many species. So you describe in incredible detail how that influences the behavior of these animals and in the end their physiology too, which you tie it all great together. So that's why people need to get this book and read it because it is a major, major piece on what's on what's going on around the earth. It's not, you know, it's just Montana, you know, this is going on in Indonesia. This is going on in Vietnam, you know, parts of Africa. And, and I think also, I just want to touch upon real quick too. You said climate change, you know, the scientific data absolutely 100% supports what your neighbor is observing. You know, we mm -hmm. are getting earlier springs, which is influencing, you know, migration patterns of, of the monarch butterfly or some other species like that. Birds, migratory patterns are changing. All of that is having a, a, a down trickle effect and up trickle effect on, on all the ecology. So yeah, that's a great observation. Um, before we jump kind of more into the, the meat and potatoes of the book, you said you, you're, you're still working for people and, and carnivores. Can you just kind of talk about their mission and what you're doing with them? Yeah, definitely. Um, people and carnivores is a really cool group and a tiny group. Like you're, you're talking to half of our field staff on the phone right now. It's that small. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a group. I'm saying that because it's a group that it needs support. And okay. um, so what we do is uh, we have a really, really specific focus, which is on reducing uh, conflict between human beings and large predators like uh, wolves, mountain lions, and, and grizzly bears. Um, and we work primarily, we work here in the Northern Rockies exclusively, actually, not primarily. Um, so what does that mean? Um, it can mean a lot of things. So we've put up uh, several hundred backcountry food storage structures, you know, in, in national forests, uh, in tribal uh, wilderness areas. And those are, you know, pole pole structures with two live trees and a cut tree hung across it like the cross piece of an h mm -hmm. that you can hang your food from or hunters can hang their meat from in the back country and those have been shown to be really effective in reducing both uh negative interactions that result in human uh like uh, human maimings and mm -hmm. and also you know having that kind of food storage uh reduces 
attractants for bears. So it reduces the likelihood that they'll be drawn in by a human food source and then have to be put down by a biologist or mm -hmm. a warden. Mm -hmm. So we do that. We do, um, we secure, uh, we do sanitation projects. So we work on um, getting people grizzly or bear resistant uh, trash bins. Um, we work on carcass composting facilities to get livestock carcasses off the landscape and into a composting facility with an electric fence around it. Um, and then we work on projects like the one at Shocks Field, uh, which is really the thing that I enjoy most because that's an example of uh, the kind of work we do that aims at taking a hard look at the tools that are available to us in terms of coexisting with these animals because bears and wolves are difficult to coexist with. And I want to yes. make sure that's clear. I mean, the farmers and ranchers, they're, they are not making up the fact that this is difficult. Yeah, it's yeah. like, it's really hard. It's super hard. I know that because I, you know, I spent more time as a working rancher than anything else. So we have this toolkit, right, for coexisting with these animals. And that might be electric fence or electrified flagging to deter wolves or any of that. But we like to try to find places where we can improve on those tools by working with a specific farmer or rancher who has a, a very definite problem with the animal. So mm -hmm. that's the kind of work that we do. And uh, you can, there, there are a bunch of short films that are pretty cool about the work on peopleandcarnivores.org. Um, and yeah, just a small nonprofit group and we do a lot of good work. So please check out the website if, if people can. Yeah, we'll definitely push it. And like uh, this interview is being coupled with grizzly bears. So we're going to be covering grizzly bears all week. And I'm going to tell my partner, Angie, that People and Carnivores is our organization of the week. So we will get the awesome. word out for Thanks. you. Yeah, we will. Oh, man. The, yeah. they'll, um, the folks at the home office, uh, all two of them will be so happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. That's so great. Yeah. So, you know, some of it talks about you're talking about some of the education. So people because I live in, you know, the LA basin and you're talking, I don't know, 10 million people living there. And, and I was talking mm -hmm. to my, my partner the other day and I was, I was telling her like, I was telling her about your book and the upcoming interview and talking about how people are bolting from California, which by the way, if the listeners don't know, the California state flag has a grizzly bear on it. And there hasn't been a grizzly bear in California in what, over 130 years. I think it is. I believe that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but you know, it really got me thinking, you know, we have somebody from Southern California moving to Montana, buying a ranch, going, oh, I'm going to go live this wonderful life. Is there anything going on up there to educate them as they move into the area, like on how to coexist with wildlife? There have been some definite efforts in that vein. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of, you know, a lot of it is sort of uh, watershed to watershed. So, you know, different, different drainages, different valleys have different programs. And that's one of the things we've actually been working toward in the in the last little bit at People and Carnivores is coming up with some um, you know materials that can be shared both with people who are moving here and people who are recreating here. Um, and so there are good. Um, I mean, you know, the state wildlife agency puts out some good stuff that's relevant to living with bears. You know, we do as well. And yeah, I think I think that resource is there, but it's really hard to reach people. Particularly right. when people come up and like stay in an Airbnb for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's the really tough one. Cause like all of a sudden you might be stepping into, you know, as a guest, you wouldn't know that there's a history of, you know, grizzly bears hitting the trash cans, you know, down at the corner of the, you know, the, the driveway to your rural uh, vacation retreat. And people should know that. So we have to figure out better ways to reach those people. That's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. It is, it is, especially the masses that this isn't on their radar and you know, they're just like, Oh, okay. You know, it's beautiful out here and there might be a bear and you're like, no, they're everywhere. <laughs> so yeah. I, one of the things I, I just, I was cracking up after reading and made, making sure you were safe, but part of this book reads like a horror story. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> it's like, you're creeping around this cornfield. You don't know if there's a grizzly bear in there or not. I mean, you're risking your life. And, and I don't want people to, you know, bears are, I think you do kind of describe it well, you know, a, a mom and her cubs. Like most people are aware you don't mess with a, a mom and her cubs, period. You know, mm -hmm. you're going to risk your life. But most of the time, bears are pretty shy, right? I mean, they're, they're, they don't want to charge at people. They want to avoid us if possible. Well, I think... I think that 
the clearest way I could <laughs> speak to that yeah. is to say that bears are individuals. I mean, bears are as much individuals as people that you see walking down the street True. in LA. True. Right. True. And, and, you know, I think this is something that we do in the human world. We, we read a lot of cues, right? Mm-hmm. When you, if you're walking, let's say you're walking down a dark block and somebody's walking the other way toward you. I, I think that, you know, you begin, you begin to look at them and assess, you know, what is their body language yes, saying? Yes. Like, do, do I feel threatened? Do I, you know, it's the same way with bears. I mean, that's the thing about bears that I find so incredibly interesting is that they're dangerous enough to us that they force us to look closely at a part of the world that we've kind of quit looking closely at, which is the natu- the entire natural world often, you know? So like a bit, you know, I've noticed this when people uh, encounter bears or they even if they hear about a bear, if you live out here, they always want to know which one it is, mm-hmm. right? It's like, is it the sow with cubs? Is it the boar? You know, and, and that's because they're, because they're so individual and because we're all like, whether we would um, explicitly admit it or not, we all realize that every time we encounter a, a grizzly, particularly a grizzly, because they are much more aggressive than, than black bears. Anytime we encounter a grizzly in the woods, um, you know, when we surprise each other on a trail, that bear is going to make a choice. Mm-hmm. It's going to decide whether it's going to charge you or it's going to decide to let, to let, to let it slide, you know? And so it's not just sows and cubs that, that attack people. I mean, uh, sub adult bears attack people, full grown boars attack people. Um, I mean, they're all capable of killing somebody. Yes. Yes. Um, and I think the thing that is so, uh, interesting and moving is the fact that it happens as infrequently as it does. It does. Right. So the, right. so I, I just want to make the two points that, you know, on the one hand, bears are profoundly individual creatures. They have preferences, they have whims and they act on them in ways that are significant to us, like immediately terrifyingly significant sometimes. Mm-hmm. But I also want to say, usually the thing that they prefer is to exercise restraint. Right. You know, I mean, I can't, tell you how many times bears have let me go and, and walking around that cornfield is a great example. I mean, I was, I, I was doing things that were sometimes risky and, you know, occasionally that were bad judgment and those bears, they showed restraint. They show certainly show more restraint than we do in terms of how we treat the landscape. <laughs> very true. Very true. Very true. Yeah. And, and my cousin was up in uh, Kodiak Island and had a big brown bear that, uh, mm ran after him kind of he turned around and i think he was like five feet from it and the bear looked at him and it just walked off and he wow. he told that story and i was like oh my gosh eric i thought eric thought he was dead like he just but that's you're right their personality <laughs> and, and you know if they're hungry and things like that so but i was yeah. like i said reading that part of the book and and i was like oh my gosh Bryce, like don't <laughs> what are you doing man <laughs> yeah like, get in the truck get well, in the truck my, my grandmother would agree with you <laughs> My, everyone who loves me would agree with you. So it's, yeah, yeah. it's, but thank you. know, it, it, it's again, people like you around the world that, you know, we, we talk about it week in, week out, every species we cover, there is a Bryce Andrews out there fighting for that species, you know, and, and you're dealing with, you know, multiple species, but just for the bears in this story, you know, it's admirable. So thank you for what you're doing. It, it, you risked your life. You know, you were risking your life, bottom line, period end of story, you know? Um, yeah. So, I, and can I just add one, yeah, one thing really yeah, quick there, yeah. which is that, because I think it's often tempting to characterize what I'm doing as, yeah. Like, like you just said, you know, fighting for a species or, or and, and to an extent, I, I mean, I really want to see these species thrive, but I also, I have a really, um, I have a very, genuine respect for the people who are making their living mm-hmm. on these landscapes mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. And so I want to be really careful to say that, you know, I don't want to be characterized as, as a person who is treating this as an either or situation um, because there's so much. So like I, you know, I care about bears and I care about, well, I, I care deeply about them, but I also care about, you know, farmers like Greg and, and other people who are trying hard to make their living off the land, because I see, I, I worry that we will lose the open land that is essential for both agriculture 
and for wild creatures and their habitat. That's my real worry. So like I, I know that's a little bit more than you asked for there. No, but no, no. I just no, wanted no. to, it's, yeah, it's really important to me. That is, but okay, so that is an incredible point and, and this will be off tangent a little bit. No, that you bring up such an incredible point though, because it's not just, hey, we need to box off this land and leave the animals alone. That is not realistic. So when, you know, we're taking a global view at what's going on out there and, you know, we just covered tigers and talking to a World Wildlife Fund scientist down there, he's working in Indonesia, he's going to Nepal, he's working, you know, throughout that part of the world. There are many, I don't want to put this, there are many examples of government agencies or nonprofits that are teaching the locals on how to coexist with wildlife and the benefits of both coexisting because you're right. There is not just, Hey, it's either grizzlies or not, or it's either people or, or no grizzlies or the other species you're, you're working with. We're, we're seeking solutions for both. Right. And that's a beautiful point that you just made. It, it, it needs, that needs to be the discussion. The discussion isn't right. the you know the far left of the issue or the far right of the issue. It's what's the middle ground? How do we seek solutions? Is what your book really does. You're seeking solutions, right? Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, no, it was it was good. It was good. So I guess my next question is, you know, your book does surround Millie the Grizzly, and I guess we're not giving away too much since it's in the title, but it, it kind of talks about her life and the conflict there. You know, why did you highlight her? specifically, you know, in the book. I chose to talk about Millie and her life and her death because she's a perfect microcosm for a lot of what's going on in the West right now. Um, hers is a simple story, right? The bear comes out of the mountains, the mountains which are unchanged since the Pleistocene glaciation. She comes into a valley floor that's subdivided and cropped and where people are living. Um, she, her story, simple as it is, opens on to some huge issues. It's a lens through which we can look at the changing climate in the West. It's a lens through which we can look at the relationship between domesticity and wild wildness that remains here and how that's shifting and changing as we go from, you know, a time, say a hundred years ago, when you had little islands of human influence out here to a time when we have a sea, an ocean of human influence and little islands of wilderness. Mm -hmm. So, you know, her, her story for me, let's, let's us see what that inversion um, actually looks like for an animal. Um, and here's the other reason I, I focused on her. Um, I focused on her because she has an interesting story and because her story gripped me, you know, I, I encountered uh, you know, I was brought close to her by the, the field and the corn and, you know, images that were on my, my trail cameras that I had set up around the field. And I became emotionally and personally involved in her story. And mm -hmm. that, that did something important for me because I, I think something really changes when you allow yourself to develop that kind of emotional or personal attachment to an individual wild animal. And to concern yourself to that extent with their story, because you begin, or at least I began to look very closely at her story, which made me think to myself, you know, well, first, okay. So I learned about her story that she had worn a, a GPS collar yeah. for about a year mm -hmm. at, at a certain point in her life, which meant I could see that data and I could see the way that she used the landscape, the way she came close to people and didn't get in trouble, the way she would go back and forth across this enormous like, sheer stony mountain range as if it wasn't even there. So I ended up, you know, looking at her story through that lens and looking at the sad end of her story, which is that she, she, you know, basically got, she got killed because of people got killed by people. Yeah. Um, and I thought the way she was living is heroic. The way she died was tragic. This is a story that's exceptional and people need to hear it. Um, but what the further realization that came to me was as I looked more closely at her story, it started me down a path toward looking at the stories of other animals. And what I realized is that her story is heroic, is tragic, 
but is not exceptional. Right. This is what's going on around us all the time in the natural world. These animals are surviving against odds. They're raising, you know, litters of cubs. They're raising the next generation of their species on marginal landscapes. It's like once you attach yourself to the story of one animal, which I, I think I did here and which I tried to give other people a window into with the book, the rest of the natural world becomes much more engrossing, yeah. much more yeah. um, interesting. And so that's that's why that's why I wanted to write about her story. No, that's why I wanted to write her story. No, it was. Yeah. I mean, it's touching and it it, it definitely is a, a tearjerker at times <laughs> for, for the audience. It's still, you know, you got to read this book. It's down from the mountain. It, I would say part of it too, it, it, like I said, it read like a horror story for me at times. And then it read like a detective story at times when you were trying to figure out how these bears kept defeating your, your, what you set up to prevent them from going to the cornfield. Mm -hmm. So my question is, like I said earlier, just how intelligent are these bears? Because really you describe an animal that's using problem solving, deductive reasoning, other higher level skills. And, and I could see that in, or read that in your book. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know how to articulate. I mean, that may be a question for somebody with a, a PhD, which I have <laughs> not got, <laughs> um, but I can tell you this they they strike me as incredibly intelligent. They are certainly very persistent mm -hmm. and creative in the ways that they seek to, um, you know, go around over and through things. I remember your, your question reminds me of something that I saw uh, in Northern Spain. So I was in Nor Northern Spain. People don't know this, but Spain um, has brown bears that are same species as our grizzlies. Um, they have a subspecies of wolf as well. And there are actually more wolves uh, in the Iberian Peninsula than there are uh, in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, which kind of blew my mind. Wow. Um, but I was there uh, and, and I was visiting a farmer up there talking about bear and livestock interactions. And this guy also kept honey. And he went and showed me this field where he had honeybee hives ringed with three layers of electric fence. I mean, it looked like a medieval mm -hmm. fortification, you know? And, <laughs> and then yeah, he showed yeah. me these videos of <laughs> the one that really blew my mind was a bear coming from uphill of this fence and basically like very carefully putting its paw between the electrified wires on the first post and shoving the first fence into the second one, thereby shorting it out. And, and basically like just flattening it really, really carefully, only touching, you know, the parts that were non-electrified and, and then gaining access to those honey, honey hives. And so like Incredible. you, you look at that and I mean, I'll tell you, that's very frustrating when you're in the middle of it and you're trying to maintain a two mile perimeter mm -hmm. of electric fence and the bears are just, you know, figuring you know, it worked. I mean, we, so we decreased the amount of corn loss by 75%. So that's a, it's a good step, you know, but, um, the bears are, they're pretty darn crafty. They they'll find their way if they can. Yeah. It's, uh, I was like, it was funny at times. And then I'm like, Oh my God, it's just, I, you know, I have a PhD and I'll tell you they're intelligent. Yeah. They're okay. Well, there you go. Yeah. You, should, you tell me. <laughs> Um, yeah, animals have a lot more intelligence than the general public uh, gives them credit for. So, um, yeah, they're, it, it was amazing. You captured it beautifully in, in words that very descriptive, very, I was there. I was there with you as you walked that fence. I, I could read that. And in my mind, I was walking that fence with you and I was scared at times for you. I was like, what are you doing, Bryce? But uh, yeah, I'll have, to, I'll have to go meet with your grandma and say, okay, how do we, how do we protect him? Um, <laughs> well, she's not far from you. She's in San Diego. So she may turn okay. up at your door yeah. and say, I, he just doesn't get it, but you do. I know. Let's go talk to him. Uh, intervention. Hey, so this is, this is different. And, and I just bring it up because it really made me think. And, and I thought it was a, a very impactful point you make in Down from the Mountain. And you were talking about glyphosates in modern ag. And I really started thinking about it because you're, you come at it from not only has affect human nutrition, right? Mm -hmm. But wildlife. And I was like, you're right. I mean, we're not just bears, but you're talking birds, mm -hmm. um, you know, squirrels, other, other mammals or, or animals that are eating some of these chemicals. 
So, uh, you know, what is going on with that? Like, uh, like, why did you bring that up? Because I thought it was a very impactful. I brought that up because, you know, as somebody who spent his most of his career in agriculture, I am keenly aware of how uh, sort of freely and blithely we often use herbicides and, and also how poorly understood all things like that are until enough time has passed for us to truly see the constellation of things that results from exposure to a chemical. I mean, I bring that up because so that, so just in case, you know, folks listening need to be read in a little bit, you know, the, the corn that's grown in that field is what's called Roundup Ready. You know, so it's, it's, um, it's basically, it's bred with a, uh, a resistance to a, to a certain herbicide. And what that means is that you can grow that crop and then you can spray the herbicide on it and everything that's not the crop will die off. And that's really helpful to the corn farmer because it allows for, you know, higher yields on the field and, um, you know, more, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, more bushels per acre. Um, but it's also, uh, I mean, you're spraying a whole lot of chemical out there and I don't think, I mean, this is not something that people have really looked at very much is the effects of, of that particular herbicide on a species like grizzlies, because, you know, we don't think of grizzlies as being in crop fields. Mm -mm. So I wanted, I wanted to touch on that because, you know, for me as somebody who's dealt with, I've raised a lot of, of calves and, you know, have raised hay and have had to make, de make decisions about, you know, where and when to use chemicals on the farms and ranches where I've worked. You know, it's a really complicated thing and it's something that we should think seriously about and give real consideration to before we, we just go, you know, spraying the stuff around. Right. Right. No, I, I, I did, you know, I didn't even think about it. I, I never kind of linked the two until I read that. And so thank you because that now is something on my radar as far as modern ag techniques to increase yield. You know, we have to feed more people, but you never really think about how that affects wildlife. So again, another great point, just a few more questions. Cause I know yeah. you got a whirlwind tour promoting the book, but there was something towards the end of the book that really stuck with me. And it was uh, from a woman. So, so Millie, you know, Millie's cubs, you describe their journey, uh, but she's at, you're at the zoo and, and you're outside the grizzly bear exhibit. And she, she says, and, and you wrote this, the next generation has got to love animals. So that hit home with me. And I, I'm just kind of curious why you included that, that quote. And I guess what it mean, meant to you. Yeah. Well, that's a really complicated quote for me because mm -hmm. I think you, so since you've read the book, you know that it was hard for me to see those the, Millie's cubs in the zoo. You know, that that was a, right. Right. That, right. that felt to me, you know, I questioned at times whether I thought they would be better off alive or dead, um, alive in that situation or dead. But I, I did satisfy myself on that point because of, things like what, what that lady said, because whether or not it's better for a cub uh, to be, you know, euthanized without ever knowing captivity or to live a life in captivity, I, I don't really know the answer to that question for them. You know, what's, what's more or less suffering. Like I, I just don't know enough about bear cognition or mm -hmm. life maybe to, to say that, but I can say this. Um, having, those cubs in that zoo. And I should say they're very well taken care of and the people that care for them there, they love them. Um, and that's important. Having those cubs in the zoo there. Um, my hope is that it's better for us as a species because we, because people who don't have access to this wilderness can form a direct relationship with, uh, an animal that's from here. And my hope is that through those cubs, they will come to respect and act in in the, act on the behalf of the species in the wild. Does that make sense? Yeah. It so, does. So, it does. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it does. It does. I, you know, they're, they're ambassadors to their species and trying to get the public say in New York city engaged in caring about grizzly bears, you know, they're so removed from the wilderness and, and that environment. So I, I, I think, from my opinion, you know, it's, they're, they're important. And, and I was happy to see that rather than them being euthanized. Yeah. I, but I'd like yeah, to that, say, that quote just hit me. It just hit me. Yeah. yeah. 
And and I just want to say one more thing about it, which is that mm. she's right. You know, that the next generation, yeah. the next generation has a lot on its plate, you know, that like we, the next generation, the, you know, people who are kids right now, they have to love animals. They have to love them directly if they can, if, you know, if they can actually exist in, in places like the one where I live, or they have to love them at a remove um, mm -hmm. because, you know, what's beautiful about life to my way of thinking is the complexity and the diversity and the continual change of the natural world. I mean, that's, that's my, that is what I care about. And I want, I want people, particularly young people who are going to, you know, run, run the world after I've aged out of it, um, which I hope will be a while. Yeah. Yeah. Me, <laughs> yeah. me too. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want people to go on caring about animals um, because I think without that, we can't really, you know, meet some of the challenges that, that are going to face us here in the next few decades. Cause we're at this really crucial moment, particularly in my part of the world, but I'm guessing this is true elsewhere too. It is like, it we're is. at this moment where, where we're at this tipping point, you know, where, I mean, there's the whole, there's the whole issue of the climate and that's something that's another conversation, but I want to talk about something really, really simple, which is we're at a tipping point in terms of our use of land. Either we're going to go on um, essentially continuing to settle the American West. We're going to go on fragmenting habitat. We're going to go on losing our open space until there's really nothing left of it except for these islands of mountains that we cannot build on because they're protected or, or just too rugged. Or we're going to do something unprecedented. Um, and this is why the next generation has to love animals, has to love wild places and open space. Because I, th I think what we should do is that we should break with tradition here and we should be the first generation to leave this landscape less settled and therefore more intact than we found it. Uh, that's what I hope will happen. Yeah, that's a that's an amazing point. And you're right. We're at, we're at the tipping point. You know, the time for actions now, not in 10 years or 20 years, is too late. So, mm -hmm. you know, it is, it is a global, you know, globally, we're at that point. I, I, I want to tell you too, real quick, my, my next favorite quote from the book is the beginning of your acknowledgements. And this is how, you know, I read the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the acknowledgements. Thank you. <laughs> you, know, you wrote, I am grateful to the bears of Millie's woods for not eating me. So <laughs> that, I was like laughing really out loud. Like literally I was like, oh my God, that was great. That was so great. Well, All it's right, the it's, truth. It is. I know. I'm grateful too. So a couple more questions and then I'll let you go. I always ask this of my, my guests and it, I think it's just so important. It's very thoughtful, but from your perspective as an author, as somebody out there, you know, working with people and working to, to, you know, make this coexist happen in Montana, do we as a species, as human beings, do we have a moral obligation to preserve not only grizzly bears, but all the creatures that we share the planet with. Yeah, of course we do. I mean, I, I think, I mean, for me, that it's like, I mean, I, I, I'm glad you're asking the question because people need to hear it asked. Mm -hmm. um, but we have, we have a whole host of moral obligations to do that. I mean, you could, it's like, you know, take a card, any card. You can say we have a moral obligation because an animal like a grizzly or, or anything in, in the ecosystem is a part of a functioning whole, a necessary part. We can do it out of enlightened self-interest. We can say we need to preserve these animals and keep them in the world because they teach us who we are and how we fit into the larger world. Or you can just go plain, simple, and easy and say they got as much right to be here as we do. Mm -hmm. And that's all mm -hmm. true. So yeah. yeah, we absolutely have a moral right um, yeah. to look after the other species that are on this rock with us. That's great. No, that's great. That's great. It's just, it's, you know, I, I've been debating it for the last 10 years with other scientists and, and I'm of, of your opinion, I agree. We do have a moral obligation uh, to help them. All right. Final question from author sure. Bryce Andrews, down from the mountain, the life and death of a grizzly bear. Besides the most obvious, go buy your book, which I'd seriously, and I'm not just saying this because I have you on, like it is a tremendous book. It had a big impact on me. Um, and my career going forward and pushing this conservation message and for our listeners, if you really want to understand human wildlife conflict, this is a beautifully written book uh, about that. 
So is there anything else our listeners can do to, to help you and spread your message? Well, yeah, I mean, there, there are definitely things they can do and, and getting the book helps. I won't even mind if you check it out from a library, although I'd prefer you bought it because then I'll make a living. <laughs> yeah, you can actually um, survive up there. Yeah. yeah. Then I can keep surviving on my farm. <laughs> um, I, yeah. So the, you know, share the story in the book. That's important. Um, support the work that people in carnivores and other groups um, like them are doing. Um, Cause there are a lot of people working right now, kind of on the front line of, of trying to figure out how do we share this landscape better? And, and that takes time and it takes effort and it takes support from people who aren't on the front line. So if you can donate to people in carnivores, that's a really good thing. Um, and then you can make some choices in your own life that would really, really make life easier for those of us who live on the edge of wilderness. Um, you know, one thing would be wherever you can um, support things like, like zoning laws that protect open space, support, you know, support policy at the federal, state and local level that relates to the, you know, preservation of wilderness areas and supports people who are practicing agriculture in the landscape in a way that works with wildlife. You could, uh, yeah, you can do all, you can do all those things. I could probably list a dozen more, but another great one would be, you know, uh, try not to expand your footprint beyond what you need in terms of how you're using the land. Um, this is a great thing. I'm glad this shows in, you know, we'll, this will air in LA or that you're based in LA because so mm -hmm. many people mm -hmm. come from where I grew up, Seattle or from LA and they buy second homes in Montana. <laughs> um, and, and I, like, I understand it. I, I absolutely understand what this landscape can do for your soul. If you've been grown up in a crowded urban area, mm -hmm. but there are such better ways to be here than building a structure that consumes land, that consumes resources, that has a carbon footprint, be creative to that extent and, and try to, you know, try to use as, as little as, as we can, because there are a whole lot of us and it doesn't take too much on everybody's behalf to add up to an immense taking from, from wild creatures and wilderness. It's just amazing points, amazing points. Uh, Bryce Andrews, down from the mountain, the life and death of a grizzly bear. You can get it on Amazon, any bookstore, find it, get it, read it, and then and then pass the book on or, or tell your, your wealthier friends to buy 10 copies. But it's, <laughs> it's been such a pleasure. Thank you. I, I know you're out there promoting the book. I We're going to do what we can on our end. And um, important story. And I can't wait to, to read your next one, you know, your next thank, book. because I Thank you. Thank you amazing. so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I really, um, I appreciate all those nice things you said about the book too. It makes me feel, makes me feel good and I'll go work on another one. Yeah, no, I, and I'm, I'm just, I'm being honest. I'm a hundred percent honest. It was amazing. I read it in two nights. So, so thank you. And we'll, we'll definitely have you back on with your next book. Okay. I'll, yeah, it might take a few years, but thanks <laughs> very okay. much. That's okay. Take care. Yeah.